Good day chaps. So welcome back to another video on odd tank designs. This time we're going to take a look at a design that was decades ahead of its time. A vehicle that has comparative vehicles still coming into service today with lethal firepower and armor that would make a battleship blush. Yet despite all this it was let down by some glaringly poor design choices that would prevent the concept from ever gaining traction. The vehicle is the STT Vulcan. Project Vulcan began as a design study for a heavy gun tank as part of the AFV design exercise 4th Technical Course Fighting Vehicles Division at the United Kingdom School of Tank Technology in 1951. The course resulted in detailed plans, drawings and documentation for one of the most powerful and advanced concepts of its period. The design, a crew all-in-hull concept with a low profile, heavy armour and powerful gun would not be out of place on the modern battlefield and the notions and ideas discussed there were years ahead of rival projects both domestically and internationally. The team of designers under the guidance of Chief Designer Lieutenant Colonel R. W. Eggleston from Remy were given the task of designing a vehicle according to a set of specific requirements. The design specifications called for a heavy gun tank which does not suffer from the disadvantages of great weight, low power to weight ratio and production difficulties inherent in contemporary present conventional designs, while preserving great hitting power and thick front armour. These specifications were further broken down into specific criteria, some of which would be changed as the project progressed. A degree of flexibility was ensured should any merits of the changes far outweigh these costs. The vehicle, named Vulcan after the Roman god of fire and forge, was to have a battle weight not exceeding 75,000 pounds, or around 34 tonnes. It was also highly desirable that the vehicle be air transportable with a stripped down weight of 50,000 pounds or 22.6 tonnes. This was later increased when new intelligence revealed the Soviets had stepped up their game in the armour capability and thicker armour would be needed. Four basic layouts were considered. These were Project A, a gun mounted in a large cleft turret giving 180 degrees of traverse with the ammunition fed by hand to an auto-loading gear mounted on the rear of the gun with a three-man crew and a rearward driving facility provided by giving the normal driver suitable driving devices. Project B involved a gun mounted in a balance on post system. Ammunition was to be fed from two magazines, one carrying shot and one carrying case, and these were supported on the rear of the gun. The magazine carried six rounds and they were normally horizontal but swung into vertical position to recharge to the rear plate. Project C, a gun mounting in a 90 inch turret ring, the magazine projecting downward from the breech into the fighting compartment and carrying nine rounds and Project D, a gun mounted externally on a small diameter ring. Ammunition could be loaded in any position of the gun. Fixed rounds were lifted by a carrier mounted concentrically with it and underneath the gun and fed through the ring into a feedway running alongside the gun. The crew consisted of four men making position for a rear driver. Now, the UK has got a long history of testing and working on turretless tank projects yet it's only ever got as far as wooden mock-ups are most, with the exception of a few like the Comrades project some years later, which itself was just a testbed for other projects in the works. And while the British have always been able to develop and design new ideas in tanks, there's always been a strong reluctance to delve into anything none unorthodox, with a strong emphasis on sticking with what's known. The team went with an external turreted type, with the ammunition fed up the main trunk into the gun, via a rather odd system we'll cover in a bit. The weapon itself was a QF 123mm 5 inch gun proposed by the Royal Ordnance Factory. Although it has certainly been covered in other STT projects and design proposals, no known photos exist. The RO 123mm QF rifled gun is listed as the main weapon to be fitted to both the Chimera heavy tank concept and the FV 207 Badger. The 123mm used a two-part ammunition system consisting of a charge and bag, although Vulcan would be designed to use an experimental single-piece cartridge. However, the specifics of the regular 123mm gun 
show that the Vulcan's main weapon was improved with a longer cartridge and heavier shot for increased kinetic energy on impact. The rounds were to be 56 inches long, complete with a 35 inch cartridge and a 21 inch APDS head at 30 pounds in weight, and a similar size Hesh round was also carried as an alternative. The APDS had a muzzle velocity of 4,400 foot per second, and 30 rounds were to be carried in total. However, there was one problem, how to load this system, and this is where the plans took a turn for the weird. For reasons not quite thoroughly justified, they took an unusual approach to the idea of loading the gun. With the weapon being so large, relative to the body, and for the centre of gravity to work, the breech of the gun extended over the rear of the tank, which would mean that any rounds loaded would have to extend over the back of the vehicle somewhat, and could be problematic. Secondly, the idea of cocking the gun down to feed the rounds up was also unwanted, as this takes the gun off the target during a reload, like some Soviet tanks. Instead, they went with a rocket-assisted loading sequence. That's right. In order to load the rounds into the breech, they would do so by first bringing the round up, aligning it, then firing it into the gun itself. Due to the way the rounds were made, each came in a pre-packed case. This was then stored either in the rear ammunition bin or upright around the turret ring with the gunner in the middle. Each round would then be attached around its base and pulled up out of the hull by a series of cables. As it went up it was tilted and pulled onto a rear loading tray where the nose cap was ejected to the side. The round was then tipped onto a second tray and the rear rocket fired, which would have just enough power to shove the round into the breech and eject it from its case, which is pushed off the back of the tank and then the gun fires. As you can imagine, this is somewhat of a flawed system, with just too many parts that can go wrong. And as a general rule, the less working parts you have on a tank for a single job, the better. Any number of things can go wrong, from a part breaking or being damaged to render this system out of action. And while its low profile and narrow frontage do limit the chances, even a stray bit of shrapnel here could in theory stop it working. Secondary armament was also carried in the form of two .30 machine guns and a .50 heavy machine gun. Protection-wise, the Vulcan was no slouch either. While the top half relied on its narrow profile as passive protection, the hull was also very heavily armoured, with 11.3 inches of armour, or 287mm angle back at 35 degrees for 350mm on the nose belt, while the middle and upper glassy were 152 mm angled back at 57 degrees for 297 mm of armour. This provided for its time exceptionally heavy armour, but a very small profile, and should any round penetrate this, it still has to pass through the engine and the transmission before it could enter the crew compartment. The lower nose, characteristically of many British tanks, was thin at just 76 mm, although well angled back at 62 degrees for 161mm effective armour. The sides and back of course are a lot thinner, in order to keep the weight down, being around 1 to 1.5 and inches everywhere else, enough to keep out some of the light fire and fragments, but not much else. Power was provided by a Rolls-Royce meteorite engine, coupled to a Merritt Brown style transmission with 5 forward and 5 reverse gears and a top speed of 23 miles an hour, but a rather dismal radius of just 120 miles. Power was delivered via the front sprocket to five pairs of rubber-tired road wheels and a return back roller with 22-inch web-spudded type tracks. Vulcan came with a four-man crew, a commander, driver, gunner and driver loader. The first two sat in the forward midsection. The commander was central and had an all-round set of scopes to identify his target, while the driver sat to one side and had somewhat limited fields of view. The gunner who sat under the gun and surrounded by the upright rounds to be fed into the gun had a coincidence rangefinder located across the tank centre and the information gathered was to be used in an early computerised system that would correct the level of trunnion tilt, check crosswind velocity, drift and offset of sight as well as use a collimator attached to the muzzle so that the gunner could correct for any variations in droop. And 
May I remind you again, this was 1951. The last of the crew was a rear driving loader who could manually operate the gun in emergency, but whose main role was taking the rear rounds out and twisting them into a vertical position and, in the event of the driver being incapacitated, or just for parking, could operate the vehicle with a basic set of controls. Overall, the Vulcan remained an STT project, yet it showed a level of foresight in some areas years ahead of anything else we were working on, particularly in the computerised fire control system and range finding. And even today, many media outlets tout tanks such as the Russian T-14 as revolutionary or new, and yet the UK was drawing things up like this 70 years ago. Today, the plans and a large fold-out blueprint remain at Bobbington Tank Collection in the archives, although the wooden mock-up no longer seems to have survived. This set of plans was redone by 3D artist LSAL to bring the vehicle back and to see what it might have looked like, so many thanks to him. If you did like this video or you want more of these weird kooky crazy vehicles, let me know and give me a like and a subscribe to help this channel grow. But until next time, toodle pip.